meeting. Welcome everyone to our uh, Board of Trustees, regular meeting 723. If you would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Second. Moved and seconded. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion passes. So uh, we have uh, three names for public comment, and you're welcome to come up. I remind you that it's a three minute public comment, and Teresa Kemp, you're first. Hello, my name is Teresa Kemp, and I work for the school district. And I appreciate all that the board has done this year. And I'm so thrilled that we are finally at this point in time that we only have one virus in our school district currently, uh, one active case that is, and also that the pandemic health has put us down to minimal. And I graciously welcome the opportunity to be able to work full time again. I would really appreciate that. And also, um, one more thing about um, the PE field at Washington Elementary. I am a PE teacher, in case some of you don't know. Um, I understand that is um, being offered to be sold. And I would appreciate you considering um, not selling it. That is my our our outdoor classroom, and it's used for the children, and we do use it uh, as a classroom in the fall and in the spring. And as you know, Washington has one of the well, one of the smaller playgrounds of the whole district. So I would love to keep every space that we have there. And I know, like down the road, we'll probably be rebuilding it. Possibly, so we don't know how much land we're going to need. Um, and then to consider make, making that optional. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. And the second on the list is Karen Getty. Hello. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Karen Getty. I'm a teacher in the district at the elementary level. And um, I'm going to read some notes because otherwise I'll go beyond the three minutes. <laughs> so I wrote some notes down. And I'm, I, I'm here to speak strongly about the mask requirement. Um, I'm nervous because this is kind of maybe going against the grain of things. But I really feel strongly um, that it be lifted and be given a choice. It's not healthy on so many levels. Um, and I'm not here to go over the data or the research. That is clearly out there. Um, it has been provided to you from other constituents in our district. But from a teacher's perspective, um, I've had many students this year um, many times tell me outright, I, I can't breathe. I can't see my friends' faces. I can't, I can't tell if that was someone out on the playground. I can't read their faces for communication purposes. Um, I could go on and on. But it's been heartbreaking to see. And it's super hard to teach, too. And I teach reading uh, to kids who really do struggle to learn because they do have disabilities. And so putting this on top of that has made it really, really challenging. You know, my heart goes out to the kids, my heart goes out to the teachers, my heart goes out to everybody. Um, but I've seen many kids wearing extremely filthy masks. Um, and that's an old, it's only common sense to see. That's just not a healthy approach to warding off sickness. 
We now know that children are not in the greater population of student carriers. So I think we need to look at that too. I do feel the school district has done an excellent job at taking effective measures at preventing widespread sickness in our schools. Um, those measures are those common sense measures of deep cleaning, consistent cleaning throughout the day, our increased hand washing. The kids are excellent about this. Um, you teach them, they will do it. We will. They want to do well. And they want the best life they could possibly have, too. And they listen to us. So we have to make sure we're honest and truthful. And um, so I'm straying from my notes. So I've got to get back to my notes. Um, and then truly staying home when they're sick. I think we really communicated well to parents. And they really are listening to that. We all want to do well. So I think that's been a really effective piece. In all my years of teaching, uh, I don't think I shared, I've been in the teaching field for 23 years. Never have I worked in the education environment in which the sickness, am I up? You are. Oh. Okay, well, I'll give her my time. Uh, I'm going to have what she says anyway. Go Thank ahead. you so much. So please seriously consider this mask, lifting it and giving it a choice, because it is having detrimental effects on a virus that has only 99%, it has a 99% recovery rate, and I don't think this is the best thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really going to just echo what she said. She said it's so lovely, and having it come from a teacher's point of view, I think, is really powerful, because I'm sure you've heard from enough parents, and um, you know how a lot of us feel, and, and maybe some people haven't even voiced it, but it is true. Um, everything that she said, uh, we can argue it till we're blue in the face, and we all have opinions, but the fact is that there are many laws that are also being broken. We have laws in the state of Idaho. We have laws in, in our country. And, um, for example, uh, mandating it is basically posing as a doctor. Um, these are medical devices. So it's illegal to impersonate a doctor. I mean, that's a simple one. But there is a lawsuit um, in Basin School District, I believe, that, um, yeah, basically Basin School District number 72 in Boise County. So it's gonna set a precedent, and you might as well get ahead of that and make it optional or have uh, religious exemptions or however you wanna call it, but parents like me send our kids to school with such a heavy heart knowing that it's not the right thing to do. And like she said, we've established so many protocols. No one would dream of sending your kid to, sit, uh, your kid to school sick anymore. It just wouldn't happen. You'd be ashamed. You, you can't be a part of that. And just, you know, I know my kid goes to Washington and to um, SMS, and we've had a wonderful experience. I know some of you know that we came from California, and um, it's 1,000 times better than that. So I, I am so gracious and so grateful to have had such a great experience, and I know it's hard for you guys. I know, I know we all have different opinions, like I said, but we have to look at the facts, and we have to look at the law. We can't just be going on what we think and what some teachers think or whatever. It's At some point, it's going to catch up to you. And I mean, I think you're volunteers, I don't know, but I don't think you want to be breaking laws. There, I've got plenty of them. So, and parents do know this. So thank you, and I hope that you will do what's right, because the kids also live in fear. It tells them all day, I'm supposed to be afraid of you. Uh, and what does that do, especially the um, middle school and high school kids, they're, you know, separating from parents. They're supposed to be establishing relationships outside of our lives. And how do they do that with, the, with their faith? They all look like they've been kidnapped and, and loved. So please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. So that is all we had on public comment. And I'm going to move on to the administrative section and pass the on to Principal Jackie Crossingham to give us an update on Northside Elementary. My pleasure. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Albertson, Board of Trustees, first of all, I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself and my staff and our community and our family members for having schools open five days a week and face-to-face. -face. It is definitely 
something that we are very excited about and know that has contributed so much to our success so far this school year. And we appreciate your efforts at keeping us safe and keeping us in school. Um, I was able to join the Northside team one year ago, right when we had turned to distance learning. And um, it was really a, a very exciting opportunity because I was finishing up at the middle school, but I was also able to participate with packet handouts and meeting families and getting to know the team at Northside. And I was absolutely amazed with the number of packets that um, parents were picking up, the work that students were doing, the efforts that teachers were putting into making sure that distance learning was successful. But as we transitioned in August to come back to school, it's what else are we going to do to see where those learning gaps might be and what can we do to help catch up on those. And so we sat down as a staff and we started to really analyze where are we and what might we need to do. And the first thing we did was start to look at data. One of the beautiful things about Northside is they have this ability to um, work together as a team with the different groups and the different levels. We have one of each grade, except for first grade. We have two because of this year's uh, bubble group that came through. But the teachers work very collaboratively to own the learning that's going on. And if you can click to my next slide. The first thing that we looked at was our math data. And on this um, chart here, you'll see that Observed growth in the area of math is in blue, and our grade level norms are projected in the um, diamonds there. And you can see we had some gaps to cover. And as a staff, we decided to prioritize math and make that our focus for the school year. So one of the things that the teachers um, really were adamant about was we want to work with small groups. We want to differentiate learning, take students who have skills, who have needs to have skills, who are getting it and understanding it. So. Um, the staff worked together to um, work, have differentiated learning within the classroom with students working independently, having extra practice on fluency. Pate um, gave us a grant this year for IXL where we were able to um, target students' needs and where they might need to improve specifically in areas based upon math, the standard that we're working on, or the skill of the day. We um, used Parapro services to meet the needs of students who were struggling and also to meet the needs of students who really have it. I taught math this year, and I'm teaching math this year in sixth grade, so I have nine students that we work with. So as a school-wide focus in math, we feel like we've had some great successes. And when we took our math, uh, math in the winter, we found that in grades two through six, 78% of the students met or exceeded their projected growth. And overall, school-wide, 97% of our students showed growth. And you can see, or not, Oh, sorry. That's why I sent it to you. <laughs> that our students did great things. And when we look back at last year, last school year, when we were present for longer times in the day and we had um, more time for learning, we actually did better this year. We were so targeted and so specific. And we had such a laser focus on what were the needs of the students and meeting their needs that um, we feel like we have been very successful in helping to do that. Um, all right, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it didn't drop off here. It's okay. Um, when we look at our ISATs as we're moving forward into the springtime, and what math gives us is a projection of how many of our students will be proficient and above. In the fall, we were projected to have 35% of our students, 35.9% of our students proficient and above, but after all this remediation, this focus on um, interventions, winter showed 52.4, so big jumps. And we're still moving forward from there. January, February, March, we still have a lot of learning left in the year. And so we're very excited about that big gain, and we've contributed to that ability for the um, staff to say, this was my student last year, this is my student this year, and this is going to be your student next year. What are we doing to really build this community of learners and make sure our school is successful? Um, with ELA, we had similar, not nearly the learning gaps or the, and the drops. Kids were reading. They were talking and they were listening and they were doing things. And so from our fall to winter, we found that 62% of our students met or exceeded their projected growth. And overall, school-wide, from grades 3 through 6, 85% of our students showed growth. And so we were very excited about that. It was our littles, though, that we were the most concerned about. Kindergarten was a new crop of students, but our first grade and our second grade and our third grade, we know they got sent home early. They missed a third of the year of learning. Yeah. And you're going to see some really great um, information on that in just a moment as well. And I think 
58% of our students came in at benchmark, at grade level, in the fall. And so again, targeted instruction, smaller groups. We were able to have that first grade class that was a giant kindergarten divided into two and um, being able to really focus that instruction. Use of paraprose and reading intervention that's in our schools. Um, and we now are at 73%. So <laughs> <laughs> our, our just you put it, you can say any number you want. 140% <laughs> of our students, 73% of our students are now at benchmark. And again, one of the things I wanted to look at is how does that compare to last year? And obviously, slightly different students, right? Because of the new kindergartners and the third graders have moved on. But 73% of our students were at benchmark at the same time last year, too. And so we know that um, this year has been shortened. The day looks a lot different than it did um, last year, but good things are really happening. Our students are learning, they're excited to learn, they're excited to come to school, and we're excited to have them there. So, all right, it's the Wi Fi. Just that's okay. I think I can ad lib most of this. So, um, some of our celebrations, because that's our academic celebrations in both ELA and in math, but we have lots of other celebrations that we are just pleased with as well. Um, we have an art grant from Pape. Our hallways are filled with um, paper mache fish and clay frog soap dishes and African elephants. And so it's just a beautiful place uh, with art that the students have been able to um, show. We're going to have a spring art walk after spring break to be able to showcase some of those beautiful works. Um, we had a PAFE grant for tech. And it actually worked out brilliantly this year because for coding and robotics, we were able to get enough in that each student had their own kit to be able to continue working with that. Um, we really give our students that sense of um, pride in their work. So we have an honor society celebration at the end of each quarter, as well as a citizenship honor that we give the students who demonstrate good citizenship and good work ethics with Husky leaders, who are the ones who are at the top of the bunch, who really show overall that leadership and they love the ceremonies and just that little recognition that they get at the end of each quarter. Um, some of our students have been um, able to participate in field trips. Fifth grade has gone to snow camp, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade have gone on field trips to Pine Street Woods to learn cross country skiing. Um, sixth grade still has planned a solar energy at Northern Lights field trip and Luther Haven. Reading is the ticket or celebrations that we have going on still. Um, Lucky the dog in first grade is a way to motivate readers. And so all of these things are really continuing with the joy of learning and the excitement of what this school year looks like. And for me, one of the best parts of the day is the beginning of the day. We try to figure out how to get kids into the school safely from the buses and parent drop off and what if they didn't bring a mask. And so I and another faculty member greet them each um, morning, and it's definitely a highlight. Each student gets a personal hello as they come into school. Sometimes they say hi back, sometimes it's a story. Today, a first grader presented me with a beautiful piece of bark, <laughs> and a second grader had painted a toilet paper tube um, red with monster teeth on it, and that was my gift of the day. I don't know why, but um, definitely a highlight of the day to you know get to chat with the students and get to you know just get a little glimpse of what they do maybe in their off time or what they're excited about for the day. Great. So um, just really excited about being present in school and all the learning going on and all the extra things that really support that social emotional part of school as well. Okay. And it was a really great slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Hello. We, we will forward it to you. That would be great. Yeah. Then you can read it on your own time. Yeah. And I appreciate having you here, Jackie. And are there any questions, <coughs> comments from the board? For well, I, I'd just like to congratulate you, especially on those mass scores. You've been working at yes. it for a long time. Yes, yeah. yes. I and mean, that's great to do it with an environment like we have. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Just Thank that, you. that focus on what the yeah. students need, what their skills are that Thank they need to target. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Thank you very much. So much. At this time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Matt Deal to give us an update on facilities. Hi, thank you for having me again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first off, I'll give you an update. I just went over uh, Sanford Middle School yeah. at the last meeting. Well, over this weekend, we discovered 
a steam leak in room six under the concrete. The floor was actually, by the time school got out Monday, the floor was, I think, 147 degrees. Oh, my. So this is just a quick time lapse of what, this is what we do every once in a while when this happens. So this was yesterday. I got permission from Mr. Mc, Mr. McLaughlin to get into the class early. So we got into the class at 1.30 with our team. And this is what, what we did to repair the steam leak. It's 34 seconds, but really this was uh, several hours. Remove the floor tile. We located the leak with a FLIR camera. Yeah. We jackhammer the floor out, excavate the material covering the pipe, locate the pipe. In the meantime, we have a truck full of fittings, pipe threaders, and everything ready to go. We fire the boiler back up, see exactly where it's leaking, repair the leak, pour concrete, clean the classroom, have school the next day. So. This is, this is real, what we do, and I can't guarantee that we can always have this done for school to start the next day. Yeah. You know, it depends on temperatures and everything. But that last night went, went really well thanks to our great crew. Tonight I'll give a brief overview of Washington Elementary. It's the next in the book. Yep. It's a study done by Longwell Trap in 2018. Um, Washington's built. 1950, 1967, 1973, 1993, and a newer portable. There might be a section of the building older than 1950. We're not really sure of the center of the core, how old it is. Currently, there's about a 270 kids. Normally, maybe 300 to 330. Um, there's definitely a lack of parking on site, lack of snow storage, ADA issues. Uh, Fortunately, we do, if we can ever do a project there, we do own a play field across the road. There could be some configuration, but we still are really tight on space on that campus, you know, with the three different pieces. Um, the engineer and architect said the site is in poor condition, lacks fencing around the playground. We actually close some gates right. and use a street as part of the playground. Uh, we, we did struggle with a lot of mud getting back to the building. Over the last few years, we've done some more concrete and paving to help with that. Um, part of the building is unreinforced masonry, which isn't ideal. Um, in the old existing main building, there's a northern annex that's newer, 93, that could probably be salvaged. Um, four classrooms on the north side of the school there. Um, but the main building, a lot of it is unreinforced masonry with the you know, original plumbing, piping, original heating, piping. Boilers have been upgraded, but everything connected to them is, is old. You know, some definitely ventilation issues. Um, old, original single pane windows. Um, this, uh, this winter, we had two different episodes of water coming out of the floor in the kitchen, up through the slab. So we actually used our in-house plumbing crew and completely replumbed the water supply to the kitchen overhead. You know, in, we've got an attic above it. So, so we did do that this winter. Um, there's a section of the roof that's single ply roofing that's been in really bad shape. There's a section of the street that well, just to the right of that is where, actually right there is where we close it. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you scroll on a little bit, Tom, there's a little further. A lot of the roof is 30 pound snow load. Keep going, keep going. Um, so right here. So the old 1950 section, the white scroll section. Back. Scroll back. Tom. The white section of the roof there, that's a 30, 30 pound snow load. So that wind loads in there, sometimes we have to shovel it uh -huh. um, if we scroll some more. So we, you know, we own this section, we own this, and then we do own this too. And that's just kind of a concept from that um, architect when he was looking at it. 
Oh, and this is our snow load map. This is kind of cool, too. You scroll a little more. I was wrong. 40 pounds snow load above there. But really, it should be at least 55. Um, so, what's, this, the, what's the picture of? The picture of? I can't see it. Oh, is that 40 it's, also? it's 40 as well, but it doesn't load in as bad because of the parapets on the, right. on the flat part. Right. So, overall, they did recommend that this building be replaced. Real convoluted inside, lots of little hodgepodge hallways, and um, also the main entrance is really not configured properly. You have a hard time monitoring who comes and goes. So that's Washington. All right, and um, so it, you know we can hit Northside tonight, or we can just hit one school meeting. That's up to you. Or really, this is not an action item. This is just. Matt, um, keeping you apprised of where we are with our facilities and any work that we've done since this was uh, completed. So, were there, I mean, you've touched on a few of the major projects that we've done since 2018. Yeah, again, without a big capital fund, we haven't done huge projects. You know, we do a lot of, again, we do a lot of preventative mm -hmm. maintenance, um, we do a lot of painting, um, you know, we did do you know, some concrete and paving, like this section here now. This just turned to mud and it gets tracked in. We, we paved that. Um, this section here, kids would track the mud in. We, we put new concrete there. You know, we painted the hallways, new bulletin yes. boards. We're in the process of doing that at Northside now. And I, I guess I would just say, again, accolades to Matt and his team. Yeah. When you walk into our schools, they're clean. They have fresh paint. They look good. Um, but I just, I just, we just have to keep in mind the infrastructure within there um, is getting old, and our steam pipes are in concrete, and we, you know, have to uh, have a talented team to keep up with it. Yeah, Washington's. Since I've worked for this school district, we've been losing water out of the steam system there the whole time, and we've made several repairs, but we're still losing water from the boiler system, we don't know where. So it makes it hard for us to maintain the proper chemistry in the boiler water right. because we don't get the water back to the boiler because we're losing, I think, 70 gallons a day or something. Wow. Um, which we've used all our tricks to try to locate those leaks and... You're heating up the neighborhood. Yeah, the aquifer, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, is it... Is that boiler, is that worth replacing at all, or is it just... Well, I, I, no, just getting the parts... The boiler, the piping. Yeah, the boiler's probably only 12 years old, but everything hooked to it is all right. Well, you look at it, it looks like it's, uh, you know, the other parts have right. been there a long time. Yeah. yeah, everything connected to the boiler. The boiler's, I mean, it's got a up-to-date burner on it. The boiler is a good machine. It's everything else. It, right. And that's actually where it gets really costly is all the piping and controls and equipment in the classrooms, you know, the ventilators mm -hmm. and, and all that is just really, really pricey. Are a lot of the steam pipes underground? Yeah, they're in, yeah, and this, they're buried, they're black iron pipe that's buried in the sand and dirt, and then the foundations on top of it. So a lot of the middle school, the original sections of the middle school, they're in steam tunnels, and we crawl the tunnels and fix them. A lot of times the school doesn't even know there's leaks. We just fix bad. it. <laughs> but, the, but the one that we fixed yesterday, there's an addition down on the east, northeast corner of the building. We're not really sure where, because we don't have the drawings for it. Late 50s, early 60s, and in that section they buried the pipe. But all the pipes are, you know, what, 70, you know, 60, 70 years old. Yeah. And corroded. Yeah, they're, they're iron pipes, yeah. you know. Right. So. Okay. so Washington won't take very long if you want to go through it, because it's got a lot of the same north problems. Side. I mean north side. If you have, I'm okay with that if you want to just go right through north side. Okay. So north side, constructed in 53, probably about the same time middle school was with additions in 72 and 80. 
Um, there's some portables. Uh, currently about 159 kids. Um, a lot of the same issues with with parent, you know, drop off, ADA issues. We did replace a bunch of concrete out front um, last summer that helped with some ADA outside. Um, very poor drainage on the play field. I get a lot of inquiries about that. Um, you know, because then it freezes and it's really. You could probably ice skate out there at times. It's, it's a but it, it does get dangerous. It, it is dangerous, but it's really it's tough because it's a, just a really flat area, and to you know, there's just really nowhere to take the water without a major capital project. Um, so it kind of goes over the site again. That's unreinforced masonry building. Um, same boiler and heating issues as we talked about with the middle school and Washington. Newer boiler, everything connected to it, very old. Some classrooms have no fresh air ventilation other than opening windows. None. No mechanical fan blowing. They, they kind of rely on a convection system, but no mechanical you know, fans blowing or sucking fresh air in. Um, the gymnasium is the same way, too. No fresh air. Wow. Zero. Uh -huh. um, plumbing, big issues with the plumbing there. We actually had a pipe fail. This was several years ago. We had a pipe fail under the gymnasium floor, a sewer pipe. It dumped kitchen sewer, greasy, bad into the tunnels, those mechanical tunnels where the pipes are, the school start getting this smell. We open, you know, we're looking everywhere. We open that tunnel and it's like bad, like hazmat, bad, like we contracted that out back. <laughs> I don't do very often. So then we end up having to install, install a pump in the kitchen, excavate, and we pump the kitchen waste up and around because we you know we we weren't gonna cut up the gym floor. Um, big flat roof, roof. Now this is a 30 pound snow load. And it does load up with snow. It's flat. Um, town's 55 now, the new code. This is built at 30. And out there in the valley, I don't remember exactly what the load rating is, but it's way higher than that. This new little picnic shelter that the PTA built I think that's rated 105 pounds. That building's 30. Yeah. We keep it safe, but it's a lot of work yeah. and a lot of cost. Um, there's our snow, snow load yeah. plan. Um, bathroom, ADA issues. You know, and simple things is like, well, it seems simple, but you know, you're supposed to have privacy between the urinals, things like that. Yeah. You can walk by and sometimes the collectors have been installed, but just all that is really old. It's, it's, you know, it's coming up on 70 years old, the main part of the building. And never a proper remodel. So um, I had somebody mention to me, oh, this, you know, this great, you know, kind of sarcastically, oh, this quality construction. Actually, these buildings, when they were built, were very, very, High quality, but that was a long time ago. Yeah. So again, they're clean and they're safe, but um, it's good to know that there well, could be work done if we if we ever have the opportunity. Right. right. Yeah. Matt, I appreciate your um, update on both of these schools. Is there any questions on Northside? I, I had a question. Maybe it's more for Jackie, but. Is the lack of ADA compliance uh, in these areas that you mentioned, has that created a problem for your students? It just takes one student to come in with those needs. And so right now, currently, we're OK, but we are looking at possibility of, you know. Of course, you should have somebody that's wheelchair-bound. Exactly. <laughs> so currently, that. we're OK, but it just takes that one student, and suddenly it becomes. And, and we've moved yeah. programs, mm -hmm. like the, the, their stairs to get into the portable. Mm -hmm. if, 
you know, that if there's a program with the, so that we've actually moved things at schools before to make. Are we in some kind of waiver or something? Or, I mean, don't we have to have some kind of variance to the fact that we have, we're not in compliance? Are we supposed to be working toward it? Or, I mean, yeah, we, I we are. That's why we're talking to you. That's the book. Um, I, um, it's become apparent to me watching the little video and hearing your report that you may not retire. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All of, so we have new buildings. Well, you're stuck with me for a while. So. <laughs> uh, thank you, Matt. Yeah. I appreciate okay. it. Okay, thank you. Uh, eye opening. Um, our next uh, piece is finance, and Lisa Halls, our chief of finance and operations officer, is here. Hello. Good evening. Hi, Lisa. I have a lot to cover, so this is going to be very high level and succinct tonight. Okay. okay. Um, on the federal level, about 10 days ago, a $1.9 trillion COVID ESSER 3 ESSER um, package uh, was passed by Congress. Um, it's called the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. And nationally, the allocation to K-12 is $125.8 billion. For the state of Idaho, that translates to $439 million. And we do not, as our Lake Ponderay School District, have our ESSER 3 allocation, but uh, we are told to take about 2.25 times our SIRSA, sorry to be throwing out all these acronyms, uh, or our ESSER II money, which we reviewed, uh, was passed by Congress on December 27th of 2020. So we estimate that this ARPA money for our district will be $5,785,000, and it has the same spending um, authority time as our ESSER $2, namely through September 30th of 2024. So that bridges fiscal year 21, which we're in, 22, 23, 24, and then three months into fiscal year 25. Mm -hmm. It also has the same 15 allowances as the ESSER II money, but it does have a new mandate for setting aside 20% to address the bill uh, to address learning loss. So of that $5.7 million for us, that 20% is $1.1 million. Um, we are waiting for more guidance, not only from the feds, but also from the State Department of Education on uh, federal programs department on what that really means. We also, in our school district, and we've just been discussing the state of facilities, and two of the allowances are for related facility, air ventilation, you know, some sanitation, and uh, some preliminary discussion at the administrative level is we will probably come to you as a board to set aside, you know, maybe another 20% of those dollars um, for, the, for allowable upgrades. Now, if I transition to the, our state legislature, on March 12th, the Joint Finance Appropriation Committee um, made several actions. The first action was to actually finalize the fiscal year 21 appropriation. We are nine months into our fiscal year 21, um, which included, and we reviewed this at length at our January board meeting, um, how the 5% holdback that was handled through the executive order by Governor Little on July 21st of 2020 would um, actually be configured. And the result is that anything that was in statute <laughs> remained in statute and they essentially took the 5% held back out of um, non-statutory items, the biggest of which is called uh, the unit, the distribution factor. For us, that translates, again, to about a $1.1 million uh, reduction from the original appropriation that JFAC passed oh, right about this time 
uh, and was approved into law um, in appropriation in March of 2020. JPEC also on March 12th has made their recommendation for the fiscal year 22 appropriation, which starts July 1st of 2021. Um, as you know, the legislature is now in recess um, due to a COVID outbreak uh, until April 6th, and um, both the fiscal year 21 and 22 now still need um, action um, by uh, the House and Senate before um, it, it's approved. Um, the fiscal year 22 uh, recommendation from JFAC uh, completely coalesces with what the governor opened uh, this session with. Um, it, it includes um, a 2% uh, CEC for uh, uh, change in economic comp compensation for the category of classified and administrative staff. It restores the teacher career ladder allocation module, including movement and um, this advanced professional rung and now advanced professional rung two. Overall, it was about a 3.7% increase compared to the original appropriation for fiscal year 21, pre the 5% rollback. And that's quite different than the prior uh, six fiscal years where the appropriation hovered around an increase of high, like five, eight to six percent. And for us, just to give a comparison, we estimate that it will bring an additional $326,000 to the school district in fiscal year 22 compared to the prior, say, six years where it was um, hovering over a million, like a yeah. million, $1.2 million. Quite a bit less. <clears throat> JFAC also took action on ESSER two dollars, the federal dollars from December of 2020, and it's caused, I would say, um, confusion statewide as to what the action really entailed. Um, in January, I talked at length about the legislature versus the State Board of Education versus uh, the governor's office, sort of who has what authority and who's maybe overstepping their authority or not. And the confusion now over the ESSER 2 is that JFAC, and again, the process is JFAC makes recommendations and then the House and the Senate have to approve and then it goes to the governor for signature. It appears that they've only approved 50% of the ESSER 2 allocation, reminding you that the, our governor has accepted the ESSER 1 money, the ESSER 2, and the ESSER 3 money last week. Um, and every day more and more information is released from different portions of the state government, be it uh, our Superintendent Yabera's office who's asked the Attorney General for opinion, or the State Board of Education's Executive Director, or the governor's office um, show for us ESSER 1 was $569,000 and we will have fully spent that by the end of April. <clears throat> ESSER 2 money, the plan is to start spending April 1st, but it hasn't been released. It's clear that there is a 60-day mandate for the dollars to be released. So that um, is, is, is clicking, or ticking, sorry. Uh, 60 days after it's... Af after it's appropriated from Congress. Approved. Right, so that was December 27th, 2020. Approved. We're past the 60 days. Yeah. Right. And are you, <clears throat> is this a steadfast number for S or 2, 2.5? Seven million. That's that's what it's going to be. You know, that's we have our allocation, allocation from yes from 
Right. We, what we're not clear on is what the ESSER three dollars will be. So um, there's so many other pieces of legislation that are still in committee or passed one, you know, the House or the Senate, and we will just wait till sunny die for that to review what is most impactful to our school district or school districts in our state. Um, but I would point out that we discussed in January that the State Board of Education has a temporary rule that expires on paying school districts on enrollment this year upon signing die. So now, generally the legislature would be adjourning in late March, early April, and now they will be reconvening on April 6th. So that's still in place. Um, the other thing that I just want to say out loud to the board is although it doesn't hit our education committees, is that um, the governor opened with uh, a recommendation to um, restructure not only the income tax brackets, but also the, corporate, the personal income tax brackets, but also the corporate income tax brackets. And um, that bill has had um, a, a lot of support. And of course, income tax is singly the state's single largest source of revenue and anything that happens to the largest source of revenue will directly as the largest agency budget um, translate um, you know to an impact for school districts. Yeah. Um, there's also just been a lot of discussion at the legislative level on property taxes and they're not coalesce necessarily coalescing. Um, there's been um, uh, very vocal from the municipalities and the counties that what was being recommended um, would not allow those taxing districts to provide the public services that they are uh, tasked to deliver. And then the other thing I would say is that we here at the local level, of course, we must adopt our budget uh, by June 30th annually and generally we do that in our first um, meeting in June, and I can say right now that we will have to move that to our uh, second meeting in June, which is June 22nd, um, not, not only because of uh, the extended uh, length of Idaho session, but due to the increases or the lack of real direction on um, our ESSER, um, at, well, on the, I'll just say all the ESSER 2 and the ESSER 3 funding situation. Um, if there aren't any questions on that, I'd like to move into... Uh, <clears throat> Can I ask a state question yeah. really quickly? Back in February, we talked about the potential uh, bill to cap our general fund money. They di they, that died. That, that right? completely died. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I just want to confirm yeah. that. Okay. Um, so then, um, I'm going to just have Kelly... I've given you, I think, about five or six pages. But we, uh, so the next item is that, I'm just going to read, going to read verbatim, school board approval of any expenses covered by or expenditures of federal funds released under ESSER 1, the CARES Act, or ESSER 2, the SERSA Act. So money from March of 2020 or money from December of 2020. And um, because we, we, we didn't know we had ESSER 2 money, um, it was not part of our budget. And so legal counsel is now telling the Idaho School Boards Association that districts must adopt an overall spending plan for the ESSER 1 and the ESSER 2 money, and that would be in the sort of the similar manner um, that you would be approving a budget. So that's what before you is before you tonight. Um, again, our ESSER 1 money was $569,277. Our ESSER 2 money is $2,571,434. In addition, in September of 2020, our governor the governors of states also had ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 money, well, and ESSER 3 money to disperse as they recommend, and um, those were called GEER, G-E-E-R money, 
and they each of these had different spending timelines. ESSER 1 by September 30th, 2023. ESSER 2 by September 30th, 2024. And the gear money was very truncated from September 2020 to December 30th of 2020. Mm -hmm. So, um, Lots of overlap in those different pots of federal money, and you'll see in the plan how um, we've either spent or recommend to partially spend in fiscal year 21, um, and that's to maximize uh, spending down and meeting all the different timelines. Mm -hmm. And so then what follows, if we just um, go down, Kelly, um, the next couple pages, this tells you how we spent, um, at, we're spending ESSER 1, which again uh, will be spent uh, by the end of April if you keep going down. Then the gear money, which is already spent the, under number two and number three. And then number four is the ESSER 2 money, which we will start spending. Um, some of it we've been approved, for example, today for buying some new buses. Um, and then the next pages are just for, as a recap, what the allowances are. There are 15 allowances. Mm -hmm. they, those haven't changed, but the ESSER 3 money now has this 20% mandate for learning loss. And then only one of these had an application process, which was for some online blending learning money through the, uh, through the gear money, and that is the content. So the board would uh, need to make a motion to adopt the Lake Pond Ray School District 84 fiscal year 2020-21 plan dated March 23rd, 2021 of spending ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 funding. Okay. Any questions? No, I know we've had this packet since the 18th, so I'm assuming everybody has had a chance to look at all the numbers in detail before you. Um, quick question. Yes. The gear money is part of ESSER 2, but it's a separate part of ESSER 2. That's the governor's. The gear, the gear money was part of ESSER 1. ESSER 1. Okay. Mm. But it's not what we calculate. Like, our ESSER 1. Our ESSER money is separate, separate and distinct. Gear. So, okay. our governor has vocally said, well, now I have more time with the ESSER 2 money. And he, he, He's talking about concentrating on infrastructure and learning loss, but you know, every day more information is flowing to uh, school districts, and I'm assuming that's just happening ac ac across the nation. You know. Yeah. Sure. So, so yeah. The, the education doesn't know whether the governor is going to allocate any of his gear two or gear three monies to schools. It's only gear. Um, he, he hasn't made any Announcement. announcements. Correct. Okay. What he has done is say, I will, uh, you know, he's accepted ESSER 2 and he's accepted <laughs> ESSER 3. Okay. So at this time, I will entertain a motion. So another question. Does the legislature have to approve, you know, the, you know, the governor's budget for the ESSER funds? Or is that totally the governor's discretionary funds? Um. I'm not an attorney, and I, I am. What you read, you're getting different messages as to who's got what, authority. Who has the authority? That's why the attorney general. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to make a motion that we move to adopt the LPOSD 84 fiscal year 2020 2021 plan dated March 23rd, 2021. Of spending for ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 funding. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion among the trustees? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, it's very complicated. I can tell through reading through this and uh, <laughs> your report. I appreciate that information, and now we're going to move on to a board topic. I'm going to turn this over to Superintendent Tom Albert, and we're going to talk about the sale of real estate. So um, what we are discussing 
is um, about um, 40 inches wide of land by Geraldine, help me out, the length of it, that it would accumulate okay. up to about 427 20. square feet. 420. 420 square feet. And it is located, and I don't know if we can quite see it, but it is located <coughs> here right. at very the bottom. very south end of the south <laughs> playground. And in um, reference to Teresa's comment, it's 40 inches on that line, not that whole field. Yeah. So um, that um, has been uh, brought to our attention through public comment, I believe, last meeting, yeah. and it is up for board discussion uh, at this time. Um, I will open the discussion and just say that um, I am not opposed to this of this 40 inches, but there are a few things I would like to kind of seek out from the city is the documentation um, to have for our own records that we have actually looked for uh, the detailed description. Yeah, we need a detail. I think that we need a, uh, uh, yep. we need a, a detailed description from the city of what the actual square footage is needed for you to, to fall into compliance, compliance. Yeah. Um, and by that we, you know it's going to be as simple as hey we're out by however many square feet it is multiply that or, or divide by that two into that space therefore we can establish okay this is the actual piece of property that needs to be um, dealt with. I think with. for our records we would like that documentation to come from the city yeah the and other, if there's an opportunity to reach out to city offices uh, city planning office. City planning office. Yeah. The other thing that I think is important that we do, well, not only important, but we are duty bound, is to get a real uh, broker's price opinion on what the value of every square inch of land down there is so that we can put a real number to it and um, open it up to the proper channels to get it done. think, you know, if it's 40 inches and, and, you know, we can just multiply that out by whatever the price per foot is there, um, yeah. come up with a number and, and move forward from there. We have been given an estimate um, mm -hmm. from the yeah. neighboring property owner, and I think that if we could just verify that ourselves as a board uh, for our documentation and records. Um, so I, we, yes. I, 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 I have a concern with this you know, for yep. several reasons. Uh, you know, number one, we need to get a fair, fair price appraisal. You know, number number yeah. two, um, are, are we bound, you know, to open this up to public bidding? This is a disposition of, of public property. So that's a, that's an excellent point, and there is, I believe, our clerk has looked at. Go, when you have to go yeah. out for open bid on sale of property. There is a um, there's a right. bar. Yes. There is a threshold, <coughs> and I have confirmed this with Idaho School Boards Association that we would need to go out to bid. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, if the board, if you as the board chose to. to sell this, mm -hmm. it would need to be published, and then have an open bid process. And then, and number three, I, I, I'd like to verify you know, all the information that we received from the property owner about the city and the building permit Correct. requirements. I, you know, we need to verify that from a third party. That's part. You mean a third party other well, than the city? Well, from the city. That's yeah. what I, you and know, that's, uh, I believe our clerk has, has made some notes about reaching out to the city planning office for that very reason. Yes, Chair Kelly. I, I went out and walked the property with a couple initially. And on the one hand, this 40 inches, nobody would even know it ever took place. It is Correct. a far end of the field that, as I say, nobody would miss it. But on the other hand, it's the city should have given a variance mm -hmm. to allow them to leave it 
but they did. They right. voted, and it wasn't a full board that they had. They were missing members. There was one vote in their favor, <coughs> but it's really a city issue. They could have solved this problem, and for them to turn around and say, well, I think you ought to go to the school district and see if they'll sell a property, uh, you know, really isn't a nice thing to do. They could have solved the problem and they shut it off. And uh, so on the one hand, I don't think we would miss the property. I agree we need to do all these things that you suggested. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, we, have, we really have nothing to gain either. The money that we might get for it is... I don't know, I think it was around $25,000 or something. I think right. it was less. Whatever it is, it it's not going to really make any difference to us. So that's the other side of it. We really don't gain anything, uh, practically. Uh, I do feel sorry for the couple. I think they had good intentions. And because of the mix-up, you know, they violated the code and how much uh, their property that they have, basically. Well, so, yeah. But I wouldn't oppose doing it if we go through uh, all this, but it just it just creates on I me mean, a little bit that the city the city had the chance to fix this and they pushed it off on us. I think uh, that we have to be cognizant of what as well of what, and, and and I agree with what you're saying and, and I, it upsets me that the city punted on this in our court <laughs> and then on top of that, what precedent do we set? You know, yeah, the, the guy on the other end goes, oh yeah. I want to expand. Yeah, I agree. Hook me up. I we don't have the property to be doing that, yeah. but yeah. It's, it's frustrating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm concerned with yeah. the same thing about establishing a precedent. You know, I, I also I, I'm also concerned about 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 the future use of the property. You know, I wonder whether you know we can negotiate or uh, like a conservation easement, make sure it stays open or or a lease. You know, so that we 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 still have use of that property if we need it. I'm sure that that could be easily done, but you know the the fact of the matter is, if if we dispose of this property and it is now owned by the constituents living there, it's never going to be covered with anything because the whole reason they're buying it is because it needs to be open space. So nothing's going to be built. So, so a so fence could move they, forty they inches. They wouldn't object to a conservation easement. No, no. You know, in fact, so they mentioned that today. They mentioned. Yeah. They making sure that that it that remains open. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'd have to look into the legal. They they um, remain, the legal. Yeah, there are a lot of things. Uh, I've got a feeling based on that. Uh, facial expressions that they would have no problem with us continuing to use that property, even though they own it. Well, we we may sure. establish that legally, you know, for future generations. Right. Right. Um, so the reason it is up for discussion is that we then can task our clerk. I'm sorry to um, gather a little more information for us with the plan that we would bring it forward as an action item at our next meeting, if you're all agreeable well, to that. Assuming, you know, that, that, exactly. that, 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 that her discovery goes. Well, bringing an action item doesn't mean we're voting one way or the other. I mean, it has the potential to be an action. Today, we actually don't have it in the action item, so we're under discussion. Um, maybe, uh, Trustee Kelly would go to the next city council meeting and chew them all out. <laughs> <laughs> we would task I used to go along. Go make friends with the city council. I may have burned um, the bridges on this one. I'm not actually able to. If not, go to the city yeah, council maybe. meeting, at least contact the, the city planner and, and verify all the information. Right, but also in that time, we have a couple weeks and maybe I will reach out to the couple and uh, answer a few of those questions about um, easement. I also would say that we can uh, state that we are not setting a precedent with this behavior and never again intend to be doing it ever <laughs> on any issue. So, so I mean, we, 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 we've identified this property as, as a possible future building site. So, I mean, well, it wasn't I, I, I don't in want this to document. In the future, by the same thing they're constrained about. You know? Although in this document, it's not the pop, it's not the potential future. I think we have to look at every piece of ground we have as potential. As potential so, future, right? Uh, um, I will say in this map right here that we are talking about this space 
and this is the um, I, but anyway, yes, you make a good point. But some point we may find ourselves here that, that would constrain a, a future board, you know, from from you know, uh, yeah. expanding Absolutely. on this side. I agree. Yeah. So yeah. what I'm going to do, be taken into consideration what sure. I'm going to do for today is uh, task our clerk with seeking out some information. Um, I will reach out also to the property owners to the south there, and then we will. Read it as a potential action item at our next meeting. Is that uh, we all in agreement well, on? I don't want to sound constrained. Sounds good. You know, all, all our you know, due diligence is going to be done by our next meeting. Assuming, yeah. assuming all. Assuming all it is all correct. Correct. Yeah. If we still have questions. We'll discuss it all at the meeting. Yeah. Uh, with that, though, I'm going to move on to the action items and take a moment for the consent <laughs> agenda. I second that motion. Moved and seconded. Any comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. So I would like to turn it over to Superintendent Tom Alberson for a COVID update. Yes. So thank you, Chair Lewis. Um, so as I do at each meeting, I will. Um, give you an update of where we are. Um, there's, it's be a little thir more thorough in the sense that um, there was some new information that came my direction from Panhandle Health District that I'll also share with you. Um, I'd like to start by just uh, talking about uh, reviewing our priorities in our plan and we are in our yellow plan. Um, um, the safety of students and staff, maximizing the instructional time with a teacher and provide educational choices to families. Um, I want to remind you that our yellow plan is um, face coverings um, are expected for elementary students in transition, but once they are in their classroom, in their cohort, they do not need to have their face coverings on. So that is uh, the yellow plan there. Um, and um, since we were not able to cohort at the uh, middle school and high school level, um, those space coverings were um, expected to be uh, worn. So um, just wanted a real quick uh, uh, refresher of what our yellow plan <coughs> is. Um, this is, let me make this a little bit larger for you. Um, this is our current data for LPOSD. Um, we have two active cases at this point in time in the school district. Um, one at Sandpoint High School and one at uh, Washington Elementary. Um, and what we know is that the seven day average, I can pull this graph up here, um, is showing you longitudinally of our, where the um, seven day average is per 100,000. And again, um, noting that if we had 100,000 people in our community, there's an average of 7.2 uh, cases per day on the seven day average. Um, so you can see that this is in a um, relatively lower spot. Um, I always look at this projection that this is at 7.2. Uh, this would be very similar if I take it back to probably <laughs> Uh, somewhere in September. Oh, yeah, anywhere back there. Anywhere back in here. All the way back to So, um, that, that is where we are. Um, and then also, uh, the positivity rate is at 5.9% um, for the, the most updated that we can get. That's always a one week leg. Um, and again, positivity rate means that um, for the people going in and getting tested, 5.9% uh, would be testing positive. Mm -hmm. um, What's the benchmark on that one that they want? Uh, eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's the 7.2. This one on the seven-day average is ten. Right? Less than one. Less than one. Yeah, that's the one that's like. That's that. the one that oh, is that's what extremely. It's impossible. Low. To say there's <laughs> no. no Right. So, so what it is is yes, it's in the minimal, but to get to no um, community transmission, their metrics are less than one per hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Um, Toronto General Hospital no longer updating us on hospital capacity. Um, at this point in time, we can't get that information. Sorry about that. Um, some other information that I would like to. Um, so, um, and then I, you know, I think I said in our county, um, with the seven day averages, and I believe there's like 200 active cases somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to share with you are a few new things that came in every uh, Friday afternoon, uh, Panhandle Health District has a, um, Zoom meeting, um, and um, I think it should be a college credit for in biology by the time you get done with that Zoom meeting. Um, so a lot of it is uh, very in-depth from the epidemiologist and the doctors there. But, but basically I wanted to share with you a few things that I learned. Um, plexiglass dividers no longer suggested. That came out just Friday. Um, Panhandle board meeting this Thursday, March 25th. They are speculating and they cannot predict anything, but they are speculating that um, their board will be going away from the um, uh, base covering um, mandate. mandate that is in place. And I wanted to share one other uh, piece of information that they gave with us, and this is um, a data tracker. And this is for Bonner County, which was interesting. Um, and this is supposed to project out four weeks. So it's a mathematical model here, which again, as a former statistics teacher, was very interesting to me. And so what they're trying to do is give communities some information of how to project the next four weeks. The problem with this model is the red here is the, the margin of error. So, so you can see that we, we were here, uh, and this is the actual number of cases in a week, and this is 31, then it went up to 35, and then they're predicting that it's gonna be 23, 23, 23, 23, with this margin of error. So, um, so I, I, I don't. I, I, I yeah. wanted to share it with you because yeah. it was shared with me. Um, you can take it as you you wish, um, and um, so that is kind of the the data report that I wanted to share with the board. So, at this time, um, board, based on the data that our superintendent has shared, I, the decline in the countywide cases. The non uh, decline in hospitalization. The seven day rolling average being at 7.2. We said the positivity rate was down low, 5.9. There's only two active cases among our students. Almost non existent cohort spread. And the added uh, fact that all of our staff, teachers, and admin who wish have had the opportunity to have double vaccination by now if they chose. Um, looking at that data, I feel it's a good time to entertain discussion among the board of, about uh, reevaluating our face covering policy, looking at the wording and seeing if there's if it's, it's a time for discussion on this. Um, there are several aspects of it that Tom has shared. They, you know, it's not all just one discussion. There's the discussion of the use of dividers mainly impacting elementary level classrooms, if I'm correct. There's a discussion, um, you know, at the elementary level, we know that once they're in their cohort classroom, face coverings are not required any longer. They're recommended if needed. But there's also the discussion of um, face coverings for use in classrooms at the middle school and high school. That's also separate from the discussion of face coverings used in transition times in hallways or on buses. So I don't want to make it sound like it's just a one sweeping statement. There's just a lot of, am I kind of summarizing it accurately? There's a lot of levels of discussion, but I want to open it up to your feedback. Obviously, we always want to be careful not to disrupt education. Um, 
that has to be, you know, a factor, but you, I think you can tell by my segue here where I'm leaning, but obviously it's a board discussion. Well, I'd yes. be first to say I think it's time to get rid of the mass mandate. No We're calling it face covering. Face covering mandate. <laughs> The fact is, and what changed my mind on this uh, recently, uh, first of all, I don't think it's needed, and I, I thought that for some time, but the fact now that our staff has had the opportunity to get vaccinated, and uh, that makes a big difference, because initially we were actually more worried about our staff and our teachers keeping the schools open than we did the students. Uh, the students weren't the primary target for the, for the uh, uh, disease anyway. So, and I think as we progress along, it's probably become harder and harder to enforce this. Uh, and I, I think it's just, in my opinion, it's just not needed any longer. Uh, we have listened months and months of parents coming in here telling us why it's not a good idea and the other effect of it. And uh, we've heard so, from students as well. I know we have one here tonight we've heard from, and we've but, heard from many parents. But I see if we should make it optional if parents want their children to have masks, if children want to have them, if staff want to have masks, that's fine. I mean, they can do it. It's just I don't, I don't think the benefit um, outweighs the negative aspect of it. So. so thank you, Trustee Kelly. And I will... Here. I, I also support, you know, relieving some of the protocol, you know, mass, I, 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 I would support reducing mass, maybe in stages, maybe, maybe, maybe we ought to just do the middle school first, and then, well, then and high like school at another time, you know, I would consider that, I, 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 I'd like to eliminate uh, plexiglass, I don't think we need that, totally, totally eliminate that, I, I'd like to eliminate the, um, the cohort requirement in our elementary schools, you know, and allow kids from different classes to play together on the playground. I think right now we're talking just about masks, and if I may. Well, there's, there's, like I said, there's a lot of levels to it. It's not all one right. sweeping statement. Go ahead. Go ahead, Trustee. I think that we've been going down this road for a long time. We, we have seen the yeah, there was a time when it was really scary and we didn't know what was going to happen. It hasn't materialized into a dangerous thing for our kids. Um, we did have to make sure that we kept our staff safe and our bus drivers safe. And um, now that everybody has had the opportunity to get immunized that wanted to, uh, you know, personally, I'm in favor of, it, it would be my preference to just say, all right, <laughs> more masks. And so... I'm going to hear from Trustee, um, and then I have another comment to add to what you just said, but I, just, I want to give, um, yeah, but finish, finish what you're and saying, but I'm going to go back to that comment. I don't want to overcomplicate the issue and create an enforcement issue all on top of that. Um, and if we're, you know, we already know that it's, it, it's a difficult situation that has caused hardships in all the schools. Let's not let's not overcomplicate what our next step is, is my opinion. Let's, um, let's, let's, set our own, let's set our own precedent here and, and move <laughs> forward with uh, education. And, um, you know, we have a lot of choice and options. There are, there are families that have kept their kids home or in distant learning situations because of both sides of the spectrum. You know, they don't want to send their kids to school with a face mask. They don't want to send their kids to school because they think it's dangerous. Those options aren't going to go away. So if we are really committed to parent choice, which we are, let's put it out there and say, okay, if you choose to not want to have your child in, in school, you can do this. Um, or and the opposite is also true. Those folks that have stayed at home, um, they're got to think they're ready to go back. Well, I, am, I, I would definitely agree with 
the optional, the option recommending face coverings. I wouldn't jump to eliminating face coverings and the plexiglass glass at the same time. I think we need more time. Stage. So there's still some barrier there. But the, as far as the face coverings are concerned, I think that the data is showing that we're we're reaching that zone. That's that safer zone where it's, it's safer and our, our like everyone has said, our staff has had that option. And hopefully enough of them have taken that option. And I go in for my second shot a week from today. Okay. So that's right. So, I think so on the so I I am for recommendation of Facebook. Not eliminating it completely. So that's where we're at though. Right? I would like to make a couple of statements. No, that's all right. Um, the wording right now is that in, and Superintendent Albertson already referenced this, in the middle schools, uh, once they're in their cohort, elementary. What did I say, middle? I meant elementary. That the masks are not required once they're in their cohort. Did I word that correctly? At the secondary level, lower class, face coverings are expected to be worn throughout the day. The thought is, if we're talking about a language change, that we're we're talking about going from expected to something along the lines of optional or recommended yeah. Yeah. without there being a manda mandatory. However, this isn't the kind of change I think we should turn around and say, hey, we're doing this tomorrow morning because there are families who are going to need time to make adjustments for their children who I are agree. vulnerable. I, agree. Um, I, I don't want to cause more disruption by a flip a switch sort of attitude. I think we have seen data that leads us into this feeling of, hey, we've gotten to the right place we wanted to be. Also, the like like uh, Trustee Kelly referenced, the vaccinations have made our teaching staff and our admin staff safer. Um, however, we're close to spring break. I would be in favor of putting something in place, whatever the wording might be, to take effect as we return from spring break so that those families who need to adjust have the opportunity to, both on the side of returning to school and on the side of making arrangements for home. But I have heard kind of a, a, a theme here, and I would like to lob it back to Superintendent Albertson for some input from the staffing side of it. Um, I know we had Brian's right there. Oh, of course he's right there. Heidi. Um, so if you yeah, have... Sure. Um, it, it'll come to no surprise of anyone that our staff is very split on this topic. Hello. It, it, there is Hello. not going to be any de de definitive um, and our staff is going to be um, an indication of our um, community and our society. So it's a very split issue. I know that doesn't maybe help you. And my job is to give you information and not to guide you. Um, <coughs> you know, um, I appreciate the sensitivity of families, of, um, you know, of which way they feel with their kids. Um, um, spring break does bring travel, um, and these are just factual things. Two of the hottest spots right now of um, cases per 100,000 are in Rexburg, Idaho, and Idaho Falls. That's just a fact. Um, uh, we're lucky in our community right now. I, I like our data. I, I do. Um, so I, I just, um, we do have state testing, ISATs and IRI coming up in April. Uh, we, I, I, I don't know. I would need to check with the 
state on um, if we had to um, quarantine students because they were deemed a close contact. Um, how do we make up testing? I don't have that answer right now. And um, we have been told that we are not going to be exempt from state exams. So th these are just things in my world, and this is not to influence you in any way whatsoever. I'm just saying in my world, those are things that I would need to, to, to look at. So, um, and I'm, I, I love the data. I am encouraged by the data, and I also, I mean, I want to compliment the staff that has kept the schools clean and safe, because I think it's played a big part in keeping the cases as low as they have been. Um, I know with Brian here, do you want to make any statement to the board at this time about teacher environment? I mean, I can, I can add to what Tom said. Uh, you, staff is definitely divided, you know, and so I represent them all. So um, yeah. I'm caught in the middle of that. It's, um, you know, at the secondary level, a majority of teachers are opposed to lifting the mask, mask mandate. At the elementary level, a majority of teachers are in favor of, this, of lifting the mask mandate. So you've got very divided opinions there. Um, you know, the people who are in favor of lifting the mask mandate look at it, whether it be vaccinations that many of you talked about, that opportunities happened, um, whether they think it's um, hard to manage, whether they think it's as effective. On the side of those who um, oppose lifting the mask mandate, there's concerns about, yes, the teachers have been vaccinated, but their family members have not because they're not eligible, so they're concerned about bringing it home to family members because not everybody has a spouse that's in the education field, so they're concerned about that until their spouses or other family members are vaccinated very big concern about students who are not vaccinated. So they haven't had that opportunity. Um, and then what Tom mentioned, um, the, the potential for a shutdown, right? That something like that happened. We've seen that in our state. Like we've seen some places that um, you know went away from it and then ultimately end up having to do um, a pause. They had to actually go away from their duties and, and leave for a couple weeks as a result of that. And so, yeah, we definitely have a, across the board opinions, um, very divided. But again, those are kind of some of the concerns on both sides that I've been hearing. Mm -hmm. um, um, Madam Chairman, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion uh, that we eliminate the face covering uh, mandate, perhaps if you want to make it after spring break, every time for people to adjust if you want to. I think, uh, I think rather than say the word eliminate, we're talking about changing option, the word. Option. From expected to, to optional. So, Madam Chairman, I, I'd like to make you know, multiple motions. I, I think we should vote on this separately. Number one, eliminate the motion. Chair, we have a motion. Chair, Chair Lewis, we have a motion on the floor. If we want to take one. Yeah. So let me let me hear a second, and then and then the option for um, discussion on the one motion, and then we can um, continue and, discussion. And perhaps as Could a point of reference. Trustee Kelly, if we can have a specific date, I would just like to say that April 12th is the first day That's the that first we day return, return from spring but break. Could you reword but the motion based on the um, comment I gave in the middle of your motion, ill-advisedly, sorry. I move that we change uh, the current requirement for face covering to make that an option, an option starting on the 12th of April. I second. Moved and seconded any discussion. And I do have a discussion. Yes. Is there a, really, there is a difference in the way these groups of students are managing their school day. It is very different at the elementary level than at secondary level, both the middle schools and high schools. Are we making any? It's worded differently in the yellow protocol we have right now for those two groups. I think that would be a different motion. I mean, that would be different. My this, point this is, are you making this coming. motion covering elementary and yes. secondary? Yes. yes. LPLSD wide? Yes. All. all Including all students and staff? Or may I refer it's back to staff too. It's optional for staff as well as it is for students. Um, 
And I, I agree with Lonnie. We don't want to make this thing too, too convoluted. So I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Yeah. <laughs> if that passes, then we go into some of these other areas and handle them separately. Secondary motion. Secondary motion. Um, Chair, would you like a roll call vote or? Well, or is there more discussion first? Yeah, I, 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 I don't favor Carrie's motion. I'd like to break it up, you know, as per our existing policy into elementary versus um, middle school, high school, secondary. I'm actually a little bit in favor of that also. Um, treating those two groups of students differently. Chair Lewis, so you have a motion on the table. If we can take a vote on it, then you could. So is there any other discussion on the motion, motion on the table? I have heard from you, um, Gary. Thank you. Curly, any thoughts? So let's do it by a roll call vote. Uh, roll call vote on the motion from Trustee Kelly. I would ask for tr Trustee Kelly, your vote, please. Aye. Trustee Supergirt. Nay. Trustee Decker. Aye. Trustee Williams. Aye. Trustee Lewis. Well, it's already Passed. That motion passes, and I appreciate the conversation we've had about it. Um, I'm, it's complicated because I'm not in, I'm not not in favor of your motion. I was in favor of something a little more dialed in, if you would. Is there other conversation surrounding okay. this? It's a complicated issue. I know. I, I, I like to make another motion that, that, that we eliminate the uh, the plexiglass divider. If, if, Her. If, if I could add that, um, I believe that would be administrative. It could be administrative. Um, it already it is be. in that. So that would be an administrative decision by me to the building principals. I don't believe that was probably in, in no, the No, we never mandated that. It, it didn't have it. to be in the... Yeah, um, really I think it was just one tool used, one mitigating factor used. Well, I'll reframe okay. mine. I, 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 I authorize the superintendent to... <laughs> there, you have a recommendation, and I think you've heard the general feeling in the room. Um, so on that issue, maybe you could report back to us on, on how it's received, because it will be different for different schools. Well, I made a motion. Well, uh, we... Just a second. I, Just a second. Okay. Just a second. It's hazy now because we're not sure that was an area that was even an action item before. Chair Lewis, you can call her a second and then the motion can be. Is there a second? We're gonna let we're gonna let that motion die on the floor right here. Is there any other motion? Okay, I I'd, I'd like to move make a motion that we eliminate the the cohort groupings in the elementary school and allow elementary students to mix between classes on the playground, lunchroom, library, halls, and so forth. I'll second that. I am not in favor at this time. Uh, oh, uh, is there any? Let's move to the second. Is there any discussion? Yes, I have discussion. I have discussion. I, I'm not in favor at this time of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We have some practices in place at our elementary level that have been very successful, and allowing uh, kids to go without masks is great. Right now, the way our schedule is structured has been healthy and working. And um, right now, I don't know that a complete schedule change is necessary. I'd rather see it in stages. I'd like to hear from the superintendent. I don't have a good feel for that. That's why these parents have. I believe that would put our nursing staff in a real bind when it came to a positive in contact tracing, 
Okay. Um, and um, so right now, um, I think we need to venture uh, uh, in uh, whether we're, I'm not talking about face coverings or not. I am worried about spring break with travel of families outside the area and then coming back. Um, that is a concern of mine, and I hope I'm wrong, and I just hope I just really don't have the crystal ball there. Um, but if we have to quarantine a second grade classroom, then we can focus in on that second grade classroom. And, and I'm going to give uh, the, the principals, the teachers have just done a tremendous job of having zones um, out in the playground. And a byproduct of that, Gary, is that um, there has been less discipline issues, less um, intermixing. It's been a it's been a, a blessing for the teacher spending time in that zone, and so um, my recommendation would be not to do the cohort at this time. I, I think um, we need to see what happens after spring break with people traveling with uh, potential. And I hope I I mean I'm not predicting it, but I'm just saying is that I just think there's some some things we are not going to know. And um, if um, we have to contact tra Trace out on a playground with uh, multiple grade levels, there's, you know, I, I don't know how we would do that. Um, so for those okay. reasons, I, I would have some concerns. Okay. And is there more discussion on the motion that's on the floor right now? No, I thank you for the clarification, Tom. I, that's why I wanted there to be a discussion on it, because I don't know what the Sure. What the process is um, of changing things around. That's why I'm glad that we're having this discussion. And, and, and you know. I, I do have to say we've heard public comment about um, how most families are just partnering and keeping their kids home when they're not feeling well. And that is so important, but we still go back to uh, they weren't feeling well, we went and got them tested, and yes, we only have two, but um, the last time they were in contact with the class was here. That that allows us to to mitigate some of those factors. Um, and sure. if we loosen up too much, we will not be able to determine that. And then we may be shutting a whole school down right in the middle of state testing that's mandatory, IRI, and that is the last thing I want to do is disrupt. I, I do not want to disrupt education. That's one of my goals, is the continuity and to not disrupt education. Uh, so. OK. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion on eliminating cohorts at the elementary level? OK, I will call, well, we might as well go roll call as we did roll on Roll call first. vote. Um, Trustee Kelly. Nay. No. Trustee Superger. Aye. Trustee Decker. Nay. Trustee Williams. Nay. Chair Lewis. No. Uh, nay. Have it. That motion was not passed. Um. I. I don't want to assume we've exhausted the conversation, but is there any other discussion? right now, keeping in mind that we can revisit this as we go on. I have a question, Chair. Uh, yeah. Just for clarification, as of right now, Black Tea Glass Dividers are handled between admin. admin and each building, and that's something that you will deal with on a building by building level. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. At this time, I am going to assume we are finished with the COVID conversation and move over to our clerk, <laughs> Kelly Fisher, for second reading of policy. Hello. <laughs> okay. So, at the last board meeting, we did discuss. Um, the two policies presented in your board packet, policy 4100, public relations, and policy 4105, public participation at board meetings. Um, 
There was one mistake I caught in policy 4105, and that was just in the heading, which I corrected in the packet. Um, it, meeting was struck, and I didn't mean to strike that. So that's unstruck at okay. this one. Other than that, um, we thoroughly discussed these at first reading. And unless there was any other questions, we will entertain a motion. Yes? I move that we approve. 4100 public relations. You can do them both. And uh, 4105, public participation in board meetings. Second? Second. Uh, Temporarily seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Wow. Announcements? Yes, I do have some announcements. Um, first of all, uh, Casey McLaughlin, could you please stand up, please? So Casey, who is the um, current uh, principal at uh, Sandpoint Middle School, um, has been um, chosen to be our Assistant Director of Teaching and Learning and Federal Programs Director for next school year. And uh, so I really want to, um, uh, he'll be working closely with Andrew and myself, and uh, we're really excited to bring uh, Casey on board. And so I just want to say congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Stand up, please. Um, TJ Clary is currently a Sandpoint Middle School seventh grade ELA teacher, and he has been in the district and has taught at Southside and uh, Kootenay Elementary. And uh, TJ has been uh, hired to be the next uh, principal at Southside Elementary. So, um, congratulations! We're going to hear more from TJ next year, and future meetings we'll do more. Um, also, um, I, I received a letter here that I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's really from the Idaho High School Activities Association. And um, our girls' basketball team, when they were at the state competition, won the Sportsmanship Award. And uh, there's one part here that says, we'd like to recognize Chris Knowles and David Miles as positive role models at Sandpoint High School. Their leadership was evident in the behavior of, of their coaches, players, school representatives, and spectators in this year's tournament. So um, again, this is something that um, is uh, very much uh, uh, something to be honored when we're recognized at the state level for sportsmanship. And um, you know, not on uh, an announcement that I think is very fitting, um, not so much on the uh, joyous side, but I, I think it's important. I would like to just um, uh, recognize Cindy Durr. Um, Cindy Durr passed yeah. away. Um, uh, within the last couple of weeks, but yeah. um, Cindy Durr has coached volleyball at Clark Fork High School for, I don't know, over 30 years, yeah. and also was very instrumental in their booster club, and um, gave selfishly to Clark Fork High School, and so um, to, to um, Stephen's family, and to Cindy's family and daughters to just say um, thoughts are with them, and I uh, just wanted to publicly acknowledge everything that she has done for Clark Fork High School. Thank you for we do have, who do we have here, principals? Oh, Phil. Nothing to say other no than life is grand. Life is good. <laughs> Andrew, do you have any announcements from the district office? Nothing for me this evening, thank you. Okay, we heard from Jackie. Okay. Well, um, thank you for announcements at this time. I will hear a motion to move into executive session. I would like to make a motion that we move into executive session as provided for in Idaho Code, Title 74, Section 206, Subsection 1B, to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of, or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent, or public school student. I second that motion. Moved and seconded. Uh, roll call. Roll call vote. Trustee Kelly. Aye. Trustee Superger? Aye. Trustee Decker? Aye. Trustee Williams? Aye. Chair Lewis? Aye. Thank you. Thank you.